Hey, ¿qué pasa, Calexico? Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, like always, before we begin, I want to thank my anchor sponsors. I want to thank my friends Camilo, Sergio, Jake, and Dylan. Thank you guys for sponsoring the podcast. I also want to thank David Gaselm. If you're thinking of buying or selling a home in the Imperial or San Diego counties, make sure you contact David at 760-235-9576. He's not only a realtor, but an investor with over 20 years of experience. And he'll teach you along the way one of the most important investments of your life. Um, and also, I want to try something new. Um, in, in order to help our local small businesses, you know, I want to kind of like uh, do a little uh, free promo for a local business. Um, so if you're a local business, uh, send me an email and information that you would like me to share. And today I want to talk about Discordia Records. They're located at uh, 113 North 5th, 5th Street in El Centro. Um uh, Derek and and his assistant Dorian have a really uh, big l passion and love for music, and um, you know they'll be more than happy more than ha happy to help you uh, find you know your favorite music. Um, they have uh, delivery or uh, curbside pickup, so make sure you contact them at four four two two three six eighty fifty four, or make sure you follow them on social media. I'll leave links to their social media um, in the show notes. So make sure to go check out Discordia Records. You know, it's a local business and we need, uh, they need our help uh, the most, especially in these times. Before I begin my conversation with my guest today, um, I just want to remind everybody that this is not an endorsement. It's just an opportunity for the candidate to come on the show and talk about themselves and for you, the voter, to get to know them a little bit more. Um, today's guest is a returning guest. Um, I got to speak to my guest today, Back in episode 57, um, he was running uh, against three other people, and now he's running uh, against one. My guest today is J.B. Hamby, who's running for the IAD director for Division 2. JB, thank yep. you for thank you. Th thank you for joining me again. Um, I kind of wanted to, you know, touch bases with you. You know, back when we first met, um, you were running, like I said, against three other people, um, the incumbent and two other like kind of newcomers. But one of them is kind of like a seasoned politician. He's been, you know, you know, doing this for quite a while now. Um, being that he's uh, uh, in the school board in, in, in Central Union High School. Did you ever imagine that you would be, you know, in I mean, obviously, when you run a campaign or when you run for something, you feel co confident enough to, you know, be be elected. But did you ever find uh, think that you would find yourself, you know, against uh, kind of like a newcomer for the ID, but without the incumbent in, in the race? Um, you know, I didn't know what exactly would happen. I know, uh, you know, the last time we talked was November of 2019, almost a year ago, at this crazy. Moment, which is kind of really, really crazy to think about and everything that's happened in the past year is pretty <laughs> wild. But, but even regardless uh, of the craziness of the past year, there are such big issues in front of us here in Imperial Valley, uh, especially on the Colorado River, which is what we talked a lot about last time because it's so critically important. And uh, so anyway, we, we gave it a shot. Uh, we were very untraditional uh, as a campaign. I don't think that there's ever been anyone younger run for the Imperial Irrigation District before or, or have as much uh, interest perhaps in, in the river as, as we have, as, especially at this station in life and so forth. Um, but you know, we, we started off last October 25th, about a year ago at this point. And we hit it hard and worked very hard, knocked doors and reached out to people. This is in a world prior to COVID. And there was a lot more ability to meet people one on one, which is something I miss a lot. Um, but uh, we went forward. I was here in my office here on, on March 3rd of 2020. And we we're kept refreshing and reclicking and trying to see what the returns were. And, you know, I was, we were really delighted uh, to see. To see our our lead at that point first place uh you know defeating at that point who was in second place the 16 year incumbent uh and then ending up in first place and then having our our lead grow from there and so that was really exciting and uh so at this point we're we're kind of in the tail end of this campaign ballots are are coming out uh this upcoming week so it i guess kind of the really the the strangest thing to think about is as for all intents and purposes for more than the last year, I've been thinking about IID, water, morning, day and night. And, uh, and uh, we'll see what happens this, this next month when the, the voters speak for the second time. But we, we feel pretty confident, especially based on the last re 
results we had in March and the trust and confidence that was placed in us by the people of Heber, El Centro, and Sealy uh, that will be uh, earn that support again. And, and that's certainly the hope, and we look forward to that. Um, I remember when we first met, I asked you about, um, you know, your age and how, um, you know, people might might think that, um, you know, you're a little bit too young. But now that, you know, we've see, we're seeing a trend where, you know, a lot more people, young people are getting involved in, you know, our, our local politics. Um, I feel that, you know, COVID brought back a lot of, you know, these kids that had gone away to college and, you know, college closing due to COVID, you know, they came back and they see, you know, they they kind of like lived life uh, outside the Imperial yeah. Valley. So they came back and they kind of like saw, you know, a lot of the um, uh, dis- discrepancies in the way, you know, the people in the Valley live and, and you know, the um, social services and all these things that, you know, that we don't have where other places do have. Do you still get, you know, that, or aren't you a little bit too young or is it like, They've, they've noticed they've noticed that more people are running and more people are getting involved yeah uh, I, that's an interesting question and certainly some of the things that come up in in my race at all or at least frequently over time is is the the age sort of question but but i'll tell you like i've been asked a few times like hey you know how old are you or that sort of thing but 10 times more than that I've knocked on doors and the comment has been, we need new blood and, and or we need new blood or we need fresh blood or something like this. And it's really interesting because we've never used those words. We've never even really talked much about age whatsoever on this campaign. I mean, certainly others do, um, but, uh, but that's never been something we've talked about. I try and stick to the issues about water power and the environment in Imperial Valley and how they're affected by the IID, which affects the, the lights that power our home, the water we drink, and the air we breathe, and we try and set out a, a vision for what we're trying to carry out over the next you know, century, over these through these next four years uh, in this first term, hopefully, that we're able to achieve on the IID board. But we've primarily stuck to the issues, and uh, people will bring up the age thing every now and again, but I think more than ever, people are hungry for something that is not the status quo and, and especially something of quality that's not the status quo. And I mean, it's interesting. I, I see all over the place. There's these uh, appeals to experience and we need ex- experience. And, uh, but, but so seldom do we ever consider what, what is the result of that experience been or what is the quality of that experience? Because if, if we look at the experience, what has it brought us when it comes to our, the quality of education, our schools, are we receiving a better quality education now than, before that's not a, a statement i'm necessarily making but uh but the, the the point is is that you have to qualify experience and just simply slapping that on a sign i don't think gives the voters what they deserve in terms of the full picture of uh, of what the future brings simply having been around a long time or having existed or uh you know having lived longer than somebody else i don't think that qualifies you to be able to serve your neighbor more than somebody else i think it's what you do with that experience is the more important thing and and i've heard another interesting sort of point over time is there's been this discussion of uh well you need to you need to go through the the, the ranks or as they would say in ancient rome the cursus on Orum, where you would go through the various you go through the various levels lower levels and you work your way up to the top but i i fundamentally don't agree with that but but even even on top of that there's this idea, well, you've got to start at the bottom, like a school board or something, as though school boards are of lesser importance than anything else. In my opinion, it's school boards and the IID that have the most impactful set of decisions on the Imperial Valley in its long-term future. That's my own personal opinion. But, uh, but in terms of this, even then, when you have very qualified younger people who have actual experience, despite being younger, they have an incredible resume and they've done amazing things even in education uh, or even active teachers at that point. And, and there's perhaps no candidate better qualified. You'll still get other candidates. uh, I would say disrespect them as saying that they're immature or inexperienced. So I don't know at at what point do you become experienced when you're 65 years old? I I don't know. So I, 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 I don't, I don't make age an issue of my campaign. I think that we just need to look at people on their merit, what their character is, what their integrity is, and what they seek to actually do. And if they don't honor those promises, then it's the responsibility of the voters to throw them out because 
there's not such uh, there's not only a thing as good experience, but there's also bad experience, and uh, we need a lot more good experience and better qualities on our boards. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, I lost my train of thought, but um, oh, we were talking about how you're like uh, kind of like old school. Um, you know, you're not really even though people would think that you're the technology guy because you know, you're so young. Um, how has, you know, COVID impacted the way you've been able to reach, you know, the community and talk to them? Yeah, it, it's been interesting. It, for the longest time, uh, I mean, the campaign was really interrupted for a significant period after the March 3rd thing. I mean, my kind of idea at that time was I just wanted to keep keep going. I wanted to meet literally every single person it was kind of an, a high minded goal uh, throughout the whole thing, because I you know, you learn a lot when you talk to people and didn't want things to get stale. But shortly after the election, you know, I got like really sick. And then then COVID happened right after that. I don't think I had COVID. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, and then all of a sudden COVID happened. And then we had social unrest across the country for a very long period of time. And it was just very uh, difficult, especially so you have COVID, you have social unrest, you have the summer, and then you just had all kinds of other things happening across the country where it was very difficult to try and communicate with people over over water issues. Um, and so anyway, and then, and then on top of that, the, the summer too. But uh, anyway, coming back, it's started to become possible to do the door knocking again. Pe- we found that people are not um, really necessarily turned off by the door knocking, observe safety protocols, hand sanitizer, wearing a mask staying six feet away from the door when you knock the door you maybe hand them a little card and then you step the the six feet back and uh, people people are excited to talk they haven't had a lot of people to talk to i think is one of the things especially in this very unusual time but we keep trying to just impress upon people the the importance of, of many of the issues that we're faced with here 2026 is what we really started off with in the beginning and we're still more than anything passionate about about Imperial Valley's long-term future on the Colorado River, which in my view should not involve more water leaving Imperial Valley. But on top of that, we have new threats like the San Diego pipeline, which would take 100 billion gallons of Imperial Valley's water and send it over the hill to San Diego with a $5 billion pipeline. Meanwhile, the Salton Sea is left high, dry, and dying. And so there's differences between myself and others on issues uh, like those two previously mentioned. Uh, namely the San Diego pipeline. I think that committing ourselves to a future with less water is just a bad long-term view for Imperial Valley. And that basically committing ourselves and future generations and removing them of the ability to have this water returned to use here permanently gives that resource away. And I just fundamentally and philosophically disagree with that. Um, but yeah, those are some of the issues and, and that's, that's something new that's kind of come up in, in past, since the past election because there's a big movement on the part of the San Diego water, San Diego County Water Authority to try and push this pipe through and study it. And some people do say, you know, why don't we just study it? Nothing's wrong with this study. We'll learn something maybe. And, you know, as an expression that's been shared with me is we could study what the effect of dropping an atomic bomb on Las Vegas is. But if you have no intent in doing that, why would you study such a thing? In a similar yeah. way, the salt, the the San Diego pipeline essentially makes the existing transfers, which I personally believe have been very harmful to the Imperial Valley and most especially at the Salton Sea. If we know that it's a bad thing, and if everybody says, even the proponents of the pipeline will say, "Well, nobody wants transfers. No, we don't want transfers." You know, saying you're against transfers is like saying you're against 100 to 10 degree days. Okay, well. If we all believe that transfers are bad, why would we commit ourselves to essentially a permanent transfer, which would become reality should the San Diego pipeline be built? Um, it is environmentally disastrous. It's destructive uh, to so much environment between Imperial and San Diego. It commits water permanently forever and eternity to San Diego instead of the Imperial Valley and the Salton Sea. And it removes the ability for future generations to put that water to use in Imperial Valley where it belongs. Uh, and instead sends it to San Diego. And I think we sell ourselves very short when we sell water to San Diego instead of using it here. Yeah, especially, you know, we've seen um, um, climate change is becoming like a huge issue. I mean, it's it, it's been a huge issue for a while now, but right. now, you know, we've seen it um, affecting us in terms of <clears throat> um, 
you know we've we've been kind of like been warned about you know these uh rolling backouts because of the stress on the on the grid and you know and, and it's mainly because I, I feel that maybe I, I don't know really but i feel that you know our grid might be might be up to you know the challenge but you know since la and san diego are getting really high temperatures um and everybody's like using their ac so like you know we see that um climate change is is like kind of like happening at, yeah. at, a, at a faster pace now so you know obviously you know that might mean less water in the future yeah it certainly does yeah a few things with climate change there and their impacts on imperial irrigation districts specifically what you have or the the risk that we most uh, assume with climate change especially on the water side and then i'll go to the power side is on water, what we're seeing is an ongoing drought already on the Colorado River, which has been going for about 20 years. The river was originally allocated for about 17.5 million acre feet, but today the river is yielding between 13 to 14 million acre feet per year. Um, those are acre foot, as I, I, as I mentioned before, is uh, basically a football field. Uh, a foot deep in water is what an acre foot is. So the river was allocated for 17.5 million acre feet, and it's currently yielding between 13 and 14. So there's there's a lot of water missing or promised, I should say, from the Colorado River to various users, tribes, various states, to Mexico, other federal uh, reserve water rights on the Colorado River. And so there's there's paper water that's promised, but there isn't enough wet water in the river to satisfy all of those those rights. And so what we're experiencing uh, with a worsening sort of situation with climate change, the expectation, at least from various scientific studies, is, well, is that the, the Colorado River Basin will become hotter and drier. And the, the whole idea of climate change impacts different places differently, but specifically in the Colorado River Basin, it means it's going to be hotter and drier. And the effect of, the, of hotter is, is that you're going to create new demand for water because it's water evaporates more higher temperatures mean, means a higher evapor evapotranspiration rate and it's there's more water use that happens when it's when it's hotter outside or when the climate is hotter and then the other thing is drier is there's less water so that means you're going to have more demand and less supply of water which puts us in a very precarious situation now the iid has uh, very strong, very old, and very protected rights on the Colorado River. But the challenge, despite these protections that we have, is, is that there are pressures across the Colorado River Basin to move water from rural and agricultural communities and instead move that water, transferring it or marketing it, or there's all kinds of synonyms they use if they don't want to use the bad transfer word which was a replacement itself for the word selling, which was a bad word. So they just keep changing the, the, the language, but it accomplishes the same thing, which is moving water from where it was to where somebody else wants, to, wants it to be and throws cash or just steals it to, to make that movement happen. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of what's, what we're up against in the next five years with these renegotiations of some key agreements on the Colorado River is those attempts to move water from rural and, and agricultural communities, which together use about 80% of the Colorado River. Um, and then you've got places like Denver, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and Phoenix that have a lot of population. They have a lot of wealth. They have a lot of political representation. And their intent is to use that to acquire more water resources for them so that they continue to grow their areas at other places' expense like ours. But not only that, um, is to, but also to have shortages shared. So we can all share a shortage. So we shouldn't have to fall on, you know, one place or one state rather than any. You know, everybody should share in the pain. But the problem with that is the way that the whole Colorado River is set up is first in time, first in right. So in the case of Imperial Valley, um, and kind of touching on these disputes we constantly have that are hopefully going to be ending soon. And I think with with the right leadership on the board that that a lot of these things will be smoothed out or at least we'll be able to change the conversation over time is the, the whole thing with the Imperial Valley is first in time, first in right, which means that this valley, regardless of it's for agriculture, for energy, for cities, for duck ponds, for whatever, or for watering cattle, everything in Imperial Valley has about the highest 
a priority on the entire Colorado River. And what that means is because we have a priority date of 1901, um, everybody else pretty much follows after us. Now, there are a few of us ahead, uh, ahead of us, like Mexico, because they have a treaty obligation with the United States. They have to be served first, basically, to the tune of 1.5 million acre feet. Then you have some Indian tribes who their reservations were created uh, prior to prior to us in 1901, some in the basically 1860s after uh, and, and afterward. And then you have like Palo Verde. Theirs is like 1877 is their priority date. Then the idea of a priority date is when you actually put water to use on a piece of land, that's the date you get. The idea being when the West was first settled, you have a user establish a water right by putting that water to beneficial use. And if there was ever a shortage, those who came after that first person in line would get cut. And so that's essentially what Imperial Valley benefits from because we were here first. Everybody who comes after us has assumed the risk of a shortage on their part. That's just how all the rules we've agreed to as part of what's called the law of the Colorado River over the past um over the past century or more. And so that's that's a great protection we have. But at the same time, we're still in a position where all it takes is three votes on an IID board to commit us to 110 plus year water transfers, which is essentially what the, the 2003 QSA was. It's the quantification settlement agreement that essentially agreed in which the Imperial Irrigation District agreed to transfer nearly 20% of our water to other users in Southern California uh, most evidently damaging the Salton Sea. And so that agreement and its longest extent lasts for 110 years. And that is long after both you, Jose, and myself even are dead. Um, I'll be long dead at that point before the QSA has expired. And, and fundamentally, from a phil- philosophical and ideological level, that is just, just patently wrong to sign agreements like that that commit Imperial Valley's resource away from us for over a century. And, and that's one of the great ironies that I find is, is we're all very passionate about the idea that Imperial Valley's water is a public resource and it should be used for the people and, and all of these high-minded things. But the problem is, is if, it's, if it belongs to the people of Imperial Valley, shouldn't it be used to benefit the people of Imperial Valley where they live, which is right here, because I don't live in La Jolla. I don't live in San Diego. I don't live in uh, Los Angeles. I don't live in, in, in Palm Springs. I live here in El Centro. And so I want that water to be put to use here in Imperial Valley where it benefits all of us and it benefits our environment and it benefits our economy. But when it's sent elsewhere, it doesn't benefit us. When we get a few dollars or a few hundred million dollars in checks, that doesn't replace anywhere near the, the amount of value that's left in Imperial Valley when that water leaves. And essentially what a water transfer is, it's not just a transfer of water as a resource, it's a transfer of wealth from one community to another. And that's why we try and simplify things down to this line, which is keep our water here. Because that is as simple as you can get it, is is we need to keep it here. We need to put it to use here. There are some who will try and say, well, we can market our water, or we can, well, some years we don't use all of our water, we should be able to sell it. Well, there's so many problems that, that are even too deep in nature to get into here. But fundamentally, if we spent a tenth of the amount of time as we did trying to conserve water and sell it to other places, if we spent a tenth of that time trying to develop new uses for water here in Imperial Valley, this water that belongs to all of us, it would benefit all of us here. And and we'd be much more benefited in having done so rather than selling it away to other places. Yeah. Yeah, um, and you know, hearing you talk about all these things, that, you know, like, you you can really tell how you dive into like, you know, you you like uh, you research, you do your research, you know, like even the last time we spoke, and I want to I want my people to listen to episode fifty seven because you know th- that one will probably be longer than this this episode. Um, yeah, that was yeah for sure because that one was like over an hour. <laughs> and um but i mean it was a lot of good information that you know i didn't know uh, i was listening to the other day and and um yeah there's a lot of a lot of good information of of you know you know the iid you know water rights and all these things that you know most of us really don't um even try to get to know because 
because like we feel like oh you know whoever's up there you know make uh making decisions is looking out for us right so yeah. um and, and 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 you know like i said you know hearing you speak all you know these couple of times that we've talked about the id like i can really tell that you know you do like really detailed work on you know research and you know these all these agreements and all this stuff that you know where our water is going and how it's being spent so you know you know it's, it's kudos to that because uh, i'm sure it's a lot of time invested and 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 you know yeah it's yeah it's my no, i appreciate it and uh i mean it was it was hard trying to sh- it shift gears essentially is the best comparison is you know like especially over the summer i i did more of a deep dive again into a number of books and trying to i have all kinds of subscriptions to stuff that i try and just keep keep abreast of what's going on in the colorado river basin especially and uh, trying to get back in campaign mode is a completely different thing because you're just trying to figure out okay how do i you go from trying to understand all of these issues in great detail and depth which is so necessary being on the board and trying to get prepared to be effective on day one and being a good board member who serves the Imperial Valley's long-term interest very well. But the um, the other challenge is like, okay, so you can go through all of this and all of this depth and detail, but you, how do you capture all of this so that people people can get it right away? And especially in the context of a campaign where, where you're trying to, there's only a few means to reach out to people. You can meet them at their doors. You can meet them at events, which haven't been so big of a thing in COVID. You can try and get them on Facebook or social media, but even then the average viewership or the time of viewing of a video on Facebook is about 10 seconds. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, that's, I, I've gotten some people, you know, pick at me a little bit about, oh, water is life. That doesn't mean anything. Well, you know, it means a whole lot. It, it summarizes a lot of things and there's a lot more underneath the iceberg there. Um, but uh, yeah, and you're right. And, and I think it's important that everybody be informed, but I think it's also important that public servants inform the people. Um, I think that's part of the, the serving in public servant is you're supposed to keep the your constituents informed about what the issues are and, and to be good, educated, well-informed citizens. Uh, and, and as a part of that, my, as, as you said right there about the trust and, and, and public servants and so forth, I think that, that the, the best trust comes from that and that education. Um, but, but also there are some decisions I think that are so important that especially when we talk about water being a public resource, one that belongs for use here in Imperial Valley and essentially belonging to the people that shouldn't the people have the ultimate say over water staying here or going somewhere else. That's something I personally believe. Now that's a, a something that other people disagree with uh, that will say, well, I am elected to the IID board. I put up billboards. I put up a few vinyl signs on fences. Therefore I am an expert on, on all things Colorado river and, and, and I, I should be able to make, be the one that makes all these decisions. But I fundamentally disagree with that. The Imperial Irrigation District has a very long history of, of public votes on things. Or in Mexico, with President AMLO over there, they call them public consultations, when very difficult issues are put directly to the people. And they usually give the people, when, when there's a, a direct vote put to them, that they have a very different point of view than their elected representatives do, which is why I think that some elements of direct democracy are so important rather than just everything being holed away in closed sessions and boardrooms. I don't think that's entirely democratic, um, just as a general governance point of view. But the point there being that the IID has a very long history, be it in 1911 with the formation of the IID with a two third, oh, excuse me, Formation of the IID with a public vote that was very overwhelming. 1919, the Imperial Irrigation District did another public vote on whether we should uh, enter into the All-American Canal contract to take water directly from the Colorado River to Imperial Valley rather than having to go through Mexico, which had all kinds of problems, especially in the first few decades of Imperial Valley before the All-American was built or con- uh, constructed, essentially. And then another public vote was in 1985, the IID Board of Directors put together a resolution that essentially required a public vote in order for any water transfers to take place between Imperial Valley and anywhere else. 
unfortunately, that resolution, which is in the IIB minutes from the 1980s, which is very cool. Um, and, and that's a fun little history project I did over the summer is just trying to read through some of IIB's minutes through the teens and the 80s, which are very interesting. But uh, that, that resolution was rescinded the very next year by another board of directors that got elected in that was much more pro-transfer um, than the previous one was, which was very unfortunate. But my point in saying this is what I'm advocating for of several things on this campaign is having a two-third public vote, which means that any attempt to propose, enter into, facilitate any movement or more water outside of Imperial Valley over and above that which we're already transferring right now, that should be referred to the people. Should we do this? Yes or no. And if two thirds of the people say yes, then okay. But uh, my, my view on it is that that is such an important decision that it should require a super majority of the people of Imperial Valley to sell away this resource. And I don't think they'll do that. Not only do I not think they'll, that 66% will ever happen of Imperial Valley voters saying that we should sell away our water, not only that, but I don't think we'll ever get over 50%. I don't know that you'll ever get 10% of Imperial Valley people that'll say, hey, yeah, that's a good idea to sell our water. Now, there's certainly some people around here, uh, a few people who think that so I say have various points of view that I disagree with on it. But ultimately, if this is a public resource and it belongs to the people, the most important decision about that should be left in the people's hands, not in the hands of a handful of people. And that's not referencing this board in particular, or in fact, not at all. It's more so referencing the board of 19, or excuse me, of 2003 that committed to selling 110 years worth of water in California and, and it, that water won't come back or even have the ability to come back until long after I'm dead. So I think the, the people having the ultimate say in the veto is, is a really important thing that will protect our water in the long term. But not everybody agrees, but I think the old people have a ballot. They'll be able to vote for their IID director. And, and my hope is within the next few years here, we'll be able to have a two-third vote of the people established in a, in a formal mechanism that will allow the people to have the ultimate say. It, it shouldn't be me or any other two people, in addition to myself, on the IID board to make that decision. That should only belong to the people who live here. Yeah, for sure. Um, is there anything else that you know we didn't talk about or, or you know that you like to you know, any like closing thoughts that you would like to touch upon? Yeah, I, I just would say that it, it's so important to vote. Uh, we're going to have a higher turnout than usual. I think here there's all kinds of presidential stuff that animates people a lot. And I know every now and again, people ask, like, well, who are you voting for for president? I say, well, well, what do you think about water? What do you think it should happen in Pearl Valley's water future? And and there's a lot less concern about a lot of things that affect us most. And that's always been one of my themes is, is the things that happen on the local level are, are, are much more impactful to us than what happens at the national level. Um, and, and, and the focus really should be on, on the 95% of the things that affect you are really within a 50 mile radius of your house. So, so few things, the more distant you get from where you live really affect you, which is a very different way of thinking than especially if you're turning on the TV or scrolling through Facebook and all you can see is Trump this or Biden that or this and that about Mike Pence or Kamala Harris or, you know, coronavirus, you know, conspiracy theories or something like that. You know, what if we, what if we focused on literacy here at home? What if we focused on how can we have, you know, the County of Imperial's budget need more effective and service people better here? How can we work toward developing full use of Imperial Valley? Uh, you, so that we can ensure people have as low as rates as possible. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I could go on listing various things, but I think all of those are are important things to to consider, uh, and, and we should those deserve at least as much attention as we give to uh, you know silly things that go on in Washington D.C. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's true. Um, um, like you said, like. Y- some of the things that happen, you know, in Washington might affect us, but the majority of the things that, you know, affect us are, you know, locally. And, and um, yeah, we need to get to know who we're voting for. We need to get to know what's on our ballots that, that are that's going to affect our, our, you know, local economy or, you know, just things in general here in the Valley. So I think um, there's a group called Valle Bota that's doing an amazing job at 
and highlighting you know the the uh, propositions and people running and they're doing like really short uh, you know graphics that like you said like people nowadays are used to like just scrolling to stuff and and making yeah. you know not spending enough time on on getting informed and and, I, and well, maybe i was about to say that to to, to add to that point it's a it's an interesting time and something I enjoy, at least right now, as much as we, you know, we consume so much today off of Facebook. But uh, I'm, I'm certainly glad to be campaigning now in a time where we at least can read stuff on Facebook. Because <laughs> I can't, you know, and try and have a conversation or civil discourse over, over a platform like that. I cannot imagine 20 years in the future campaigning on TikTok and trying to explain some, <laughs> some longer term issues on a vine or something like that. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, like we're getting so used to like um, short bursts of information. And, and I think that we need to spend a little more time on, on, you know, especially big issues like, you know, water and, and, and in our environment, um, you yeah. know, it, it's, it's crazy how much, you know, how much um, we've seen the effects of climate change progress, like in the last couple of years, you know, it's, it's, it's just crazy how like all these fires and, you know, droughts and, and they're not highlighted as much on, on the news, but you know, they're happening and, you know, we really don't, don't um, invest enough time and, and, and money and effort into them. And, and, you know, the ID and the Colorado river are a huge impact into you know, our community and in our daily lives that, you know, we need to really, really be informed and, and, and know what's going on at IAD. Very much so. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and like I said earlier, I want to invite everybody to check out episode 57. Um, I'll leave a link in the show notes. Um, is it was a more, uh, deep dive into, you know, JB's campaign, um, and uh, get to know him a little bit more. I know normally I got I have my guests, you know, tell us a little bit about themselves. But since we already did an episode fifty seven, I think you know people yeah. should go and invest a little time in that that episode because it is long, but it's really really informative. Um, and I want to remind everybody that this is not an endorsement. Um, you know, I'm just trying to have a conversation with one of the candidates for ID Division Two, and you, the voter, get to know him and get to know you know what this campaign is all about and you know what. His plans are for the IED in the future of the Imperial Valley. Um, and if you're a candidate and you want to be on the show, you know, send me an email. Um, I'll be more than help, more than glad to have you on. Just a question of time because, you know, we're getting so close to, you know, election day and, you know, mail in ballots coming in and, you know, but you let me know um, and I'll be more than glad to. Um, and I want to thank you again, JB, for hanging out, you know, chatting. Um, I know we could talk for hours, but um, I know you must be busy and, and trying to also maybe have a little, you know, break in between with uh, the campaign. But I really. Yeah, it's it's nice to have a, a more in-depth conversation. That's something um, that tends not to happen a lot in campaigns. You have to unfortunately reduce things down to a place where a, a lot of the time you can capture people's attention. Sometimes people don't pay a lot of attention to the more detailed and depth stuff. They'll pay attention to more or sensational sorts of things. So you try and be as informative as possible and meet people where they are and, and try and make things be engaging. But uh, it's really refreshing to be able to, to have a more in-depth conversation where you can weigh and consider and compare and contrast and try and go into the background and look at things in more depth and complexity. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, one of my friends told me like, oh, your podcasts are kind of boring because they're too long. I'm like, you know what, then my podcast is probably not for you because I feel that the people that really, you know, listen to a podcast, and, and, you know, like I, I could listen to a three hour podcast and, you know, I'll learn a lot. And I feel that, you know, the people that really listen to podcasts and invest time in podcasts, you know, you know, those are the listeners that, you know, would really enjoy conversations like this where it's like a lot of information but yet you know you know you invest that time and 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 you learn a lot and that's you know one of my biggest goals and you know when it comes to like the podcast you know for me to learn something and for the people that are listening to us to learn something and yeah like it might uh might involve you investing a little bit of time but you know i feel that at the end of the day is well worth it and um that's the people that i'm trying to you know focus on like you know sometimes uh, uh, one of my episodes might be too long but you know i feel that 
whenever I feel that the episode is too long is because I let it go that long because it was really good information, a really good conversation. And yeah, I felt that, uh, you know, that um, me and the people who, who are listening are going to learn something. But but yeah, um, I want to thank you again. Uh, wish you luck on the campaign. Um, and everybody make sure to check out episode 57, which is more uh, in-depth conversation. Like I said, today was a little bit more of a catch up, you know, see where we're at in terms of the campaign and um, see if anything had changed. But um, yeah, thank you guys for listening. Thank you for hanging out, JB. And um, we'll see you guys. Oh, make sure to wear your face masks. Wash yes, your hands. and vote. And vote. Now oh, yeah. you don't even have to go out to vote. Just go out to your mailbox. Exactly. In your pajamas. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, because I wanted to really uh, focus on that as well. Make sure to vote. Make sure you wear your face mask, wash your hands, and social distance. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Awesome. Awesome.